two, one. Abracadabra, everybody. This is Greg Philipson that will bring to you today the magic of Judaism. And I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about what abracadabra actually means. We've all heard that many times and seen it in shows. And it translates to, I create what I speak. But it's really from an Aramaic phrase, avra kadabra, meaning I will create as I speak. And the source is literally three Hebrew words, ab meaning father, ben meaning son, and ruach akadosh, meaning the Holy Spirit. And it's from the uh, Chaldeans. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of them, but the Chaldeans are an Aramaic speaking Eastern Rite Catholic uh, group that were indigenous to the country of what is today Iraq. They have a history and the word abracadabra goes back 5,500 years during the uh, Mesopotamia era. So this is how old magic is and how long Judaism has actually played a part in it. And I'd like to begin with probably the most prominent uh, Jewish magician, which is Harry Houdini. And many of you know that his real name uh, before his stage name was Eric Weiss. And these are the years that he lived from 1874 and perished a little bit young in 1926. He was American, but he was of Hungarian descent and quite an illusionist. And he was honored in 2002 with a US 37 cent postage stamp um, that's quite lovely. And I really love the uh, US Postal Service's uh, philatelic magazine, how they hung the stamp upside down with the chains on it, like it's a real famous Houdini trick. Uh, one of the other interesting things about Houdini that many of us uh, probably don't know is that in that stamp, there's apparently uh, some way to see something of him in chains. And I have this stamp decoder that I've actually given away, unfortunately, so I wasn't able to check it specifically. But the US Postal Service came out with stamp decoders that you could buy and it made like uh, secret images appear uh, from these stamps. And I believe that Harry Houdini was one of those uh, that you could make some fun with as a collector and especially for kids. Maybe a way to bring kids into postal collecting. The uh, ceremony program from the uh, post, post office here, you could see the first day of issue in July of 2002. I thought it was also remarkable how they did the text of Harry Houdini hanging upside down, much like they did the cover of the magazine that we just saw. Some fun stuff. And I might also mention that the background you see in my PowerPoint are the actual eyes of Harry Houdini from one of the most famous images um, that's uh, out in the uh, market today. Now, something that uh, you probably haven't seen too much, you can see the, the very iconic image of Houdini and chains on the left, but there's some interesting other philatelic things here. Uh, in 1951, uh, there was a, uh, from the uh, International Brotherhood of Magicians, issued a label uh, celebrating the, uh, the, the passing of uh, Harry Houdini in 1926. And uh, um, also there was a movie starring uh, Tony Curtis and uh, that came out in 1953. So you can see a little label that Mozambique came out with. And the country of Grenada came out with a Harry Houdini, very interesting image of him. I've really not seen that anywhere else before. Now, one of the other labels that came out, I call it a label, Angola put it out. I'm not sure if it's real postage or not. But these are famous, it says legends of the 20th century. And you can see Harry Houdini up in the top uh, left there. Um, it's, they've used that iconic image that you see in the far left of the screen. But there's some other interesting people on here, Steven Spielberg, Woody Allen, Barbara Streisand, of course, Albert Einstein and Kirk Douglas. And it's fascinating that he's considered, at least in this particular environment, as one of the world famous Jewish 
uh, legends uh, of the 20th century. Now here's something that many people may not really know an awful lot about. Harry Houdini was also a pioneer in powered aviation, in powered flight. And in 2010, the country of Australia issued a series of three stamps, one of which you see here is Harry Houdini's 18 March of 1910 powered flight in a biplane. And you can see also on the back that on that what would be an early tail fin, you can see the name Houdini. So it appears twice on this actual, actual stamp. In uh, 1909, I believe it was, he actually purchased a biplane and hired a full-time mechanic um, to actually teach him and get this plane functional and went to Australia. And I believe he had, uh, you could double check these, uh, the, the facts on some of this, but I believe he had about three flights. And uh, after the third one, um, he actually never ever flew again. There was no accident. They were all successful flights, the ones he took. But the country of Australia actually issued a $1 coin. And what you see here in this uh, little first day of issue uh, envelope below is the front and back of that coin inserted into a uh, first day envelope, if you will. This is the official first day cover issued in Victoria. And on the back side, there's a, a, a pardon me, there's also a card on the left that gives a, a quite an interesting um, um, information panel about all three of the uh, uh, aviators that were involved in flight in Australia during that time. They set some interesting records. And I don't have this in my possession yet, but this is one of two that I've seen of actually the stamp postally used. And this was uh, sent from a, uh, a, a small area in Victoria, Australia. And it's in the mail to me coming from Portugal. And it's beautiful. It's got a great cachet of the uh, actual stamp on there. It's philatelic mail, it's air mail. And uh, the, the seller of this, I bought it on the website called Del Camp that many of you know. Uh, he said that he's just scrambled the um, uh, the letter so that nobody can see the thing. When I get it, it'll have the actual um, proper address and what have you. So I thought it was fun to own it where we could actually see the stamp actually used. Um, there's a number of different places that have issued some interesting things. Um, in 1976, there's a 50th anniversary stamp from Jersey and it's uh, really, I thought it's quite clever. Oh, and also if, if you didn't know, uh, Houdini passed away on uh, Halloween on October 31st of 1926. And these are some of the handcuffs uh, in that cancel, the uh, Houdini cancel that this uh, variety club, the Houdini Variety Club came out with. Now, uh, I will be uh, uh, frank with you here. I do not own this photograph. I found this, it's selling for $1,700. Uh, however, it's very interesting. It is uh, from the 1930s. And there's a nice letter and it just shows how many different Houdini clubs there are, how many there were. And you can see at the bottom, the uh, insignia of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. That's not IBM as most of us know it today. IBM is um, the magician uh, organization. So uh, these are just a couple of uh, the letters. Uh, very nice, it's uh, 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 dated 1931. And another thing about these clubs, um, these are from the Jewish hospitals, um, uh, from a Jewish hospital in Philadelphia. And it's very interesting. They both mention the Houdini Club. And it's so important as we'll see that magicians, there's so many made their livings from it, but there's so many amateur magicians that just take this to make people happy, kids and adults in hospitals and bringing some fun and, and some hilarity, if you will, um, to the world. And this is just an example of these uh, Houdini clubs in action. Now, David Copperfield, who is one of the, uh, I, I think Forbes said the most commercially successful magician in history. I had the opportunity over this past weekend 
um, to actually interact on a 30 minute live presentation he did. And he's won 21 Emmy Awards, 38 Emmy nom nominations. And he is, uh, again, he was born David Seth Kotkin, and he mentioned recently that he likes to see his son play hockey because it's got Kotkin on the uh, back of his jersey. But as the most successful magician in history, this is um, the uh, la this label sheet or the stamp sheet on the far right. I really like that because it's got both Copperfield and Houdini, two of the greatest magicians that have ever lived, let alone Jewish magicians, uh, on the same uh, stamp sheet. It's kind of fun and it's a, a, a real doozy. Now this is uh, a picture of David Copperfield with my cousin, Sarah Crasson, who's an attorney by trade, but um, she's an amateur magician and uh, quite proficient at her, both of her trades. And this is her with David Copperfield. Uh, Sarah was on the uh, uh, meeting with David over the weekend, and she's the author of a book called Own Your Magic. As an attorney, um, she's very interested in how magicians can actually, you'll learn during this presentation, how many magicians actually create the magic that they're doing. And they want to have trademarks and, uh, and patents and so on. It's, it's a very lucrative and a big business. And for people that are interested in protecting themselves, she wrote the book with all the appropriate forms and what have it in there so people can do a step by step. That's her bear, Bamberg. And uh, Bamberg performs with her all the time. And one of the things you'll see later, we'll find out about why it's the bear is named Bamberg. Now, Sarah comes from a family of magicians, and that's her mom, my cousins, David and Minna Crasson in New York. And David, of course, was the magician to stars. That's uh, Michelle and I at our wedding in New York City at the synagogue, and David is performing magic there. Now, what's even nicer, in Hebrew, there's a saying called Lador Vador. It means from generation to generation. And that is their grandson, uh, Minna and David's grandson, Max. And he's also a, uh, a budding magician, as you can see, outside his apartment in New York. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's very, very important because all of the people you see, all the Crassons, my family, this is Dr. High Penn from Houston, a very dear friend of mine. And uh, he goes around as I do, not with magic, but he does magic for at retirement homes and places like that. And he also is a, is a dear friend of uh, David Copperfield, as you can see on the right. And uh, it's very important. So many people are out there doing free things and providing magic for a lot of people uh, to bring some joy and happiness into the world. And this little picture here uh, is our Israel and Malka Philipson, and uh, we call this Beauty and the Beast. And Israel, as you see it by his uh, sash on there, uh, he's obviously having some difficulty, and we call him in our family a real Houdini wannabe. Now, some of you may know this guy. Although Magic Magazine is no longer being cut published, this is the great Ballantyne, Carl Ballantyne, who probably was the only magician who never really completed a trick. His shtick was that uh, he would perform and everything was a joke. Nothing ever seemed to work. But he was quite famous. And uh, this is him performing, the world's greatest magician who never made a trick work, but you may know him from Gruber in Mikhail's Navy. That was really his uh, secondary claim to fame. So we have this card and it's just kind of some fun stuff, but uh, uh, Carl Ballantyne is the uh, great Ballantyne and Gruber in Mikhail's Navy. Now, this is a very interesting guy. This is a Jewish guy named Theo Bamberg. And I want to just check my notes here because there's some really important stuff about the Bambergs. And uh, that's where the name of my cousin Sarah's bear comes from, Bamberg. That's the, uh, their name. 
there were six um, generations of Dutch magicians, all from the Bamberg family. They were an upper, upper middle class, unorthodox Jewish family. The oldest sons were magicians and carried on the tradition to the next generation. Theo Bamberg's two younger brothers were also magicians. Three Bambergs were court magicians entertaining the royal family. The chain was unbroken for 165 years from the 18th to the 20th centuries. The Bambergs were not only expert magicians, but also trained actors. And we have, um, there's some beautiful things here, programs from the 20s, the 40s, uh, tokens that were very common in the, uh, in the industry. Max Molini was another quite famous uh, Jewish magician. And he, uh, he lived uh, from 1873 to 1942. His name was Max Kat, Katz Breit. And he performed for presidents and at Buckingham Palace. Interesting, he was from Poland, but he died in Honolulu. Very interesting guy. And as you can see, the things from our collection, uh, quite an entertainer and very famous in his day. Herman the Great was another uh, famous uh, Jewish magician from France. He lived from 1844 to 1896. He died in New York. He was only 52 years old, but uh, quite famous. And uh, had, uh, these were very big productions, not just shows there. Somebody would stand up and do some magic. These were huge stage shows. And as you see by some of these graphics here, we're going to talk more about the uh, uh, some of the uh, lithographs and posters that were created. Although his wife, Adelaide, uh, was not Jewish, she was very accepted by his family. Uh, she was born in England in 1853 and died in 1932 in New York, but she was also a wonderful, wonderful magician. And you can see here from this postcard, uh, Adelaide Herman's Sleeping Beauty trick. Uh, she was known as the Queen of Magic, a beautiful woman, both from her performance capabilities and, and, and the way she was perceived in public. Now, uh, Sam Berland is another very important person uh, in Jewish magic. So some people, although they, they were performers, people like Berland were magic dealers and inventors of magic. And we talked about Sarah's book, and many of these people invented their own, own tricks or paid fees to uh, utilize the tricks that other people had invented or improve on those tricks and made them even um, uh, more exciting. And this is just one of the publications that uh, Berland put out uh, about ma amazing tricks with cups. And amateur, you know, they used to have magic shops around. Uh, people bought this by the thousands. Another Jewish magician, this is a beautiful issue of the Sp Sphinx, Sphinx magazine that we have in the collection from 1926. This is also no longer being published. But Joe Berg was a magician, uh, like Berland, an author and a magic dealer. And I wrote a prolific inventor and improver of tricks and a master maker of trick decks. Obviously, cards, tricks were very, very important. Now, the great Raymond, Maurice Raymond, uh, wished everybody a happy new year in English and Yiddish on one of his publications. There's not a tremendous uh, information about him, but uh, he, it says to read, see the key. And I have yet to find anybody that knows what that key is and um, what that really means, but we know that that's a uh, Yiddish uh, happy new year message. You know, here's a couple of interesting things. The uh, mysterious Snyder on the right. Um, take a look at both images. I have a couple of these postcards. They're pretty hard to find. Um, it's the uh, uh, Israelite uh, Artistic Club, Miss Sonia and Sims. And if you look very closely, those are either twins or somebody in drag or something. But again, there's been a write-up about this, but nobody can quite figure out what this was really all about. Now on the left, we've uh, another guy, this was a German, um, you can see the Jewish icons, uh, even in the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, crescent moon up there has a uh, Mogan David, a Star of David. And this is uh, the Ramesh, the Turkish um, 
illusionist or magician and a postcard of, with his image on it and his performance, but we know little about him as well. Now, of course, it's difficult to talk about almost anything Jewish without finding something or someone, as you'll see, um, anti-Semitic. So I said the magic of anti-Semitism. So uh, here's a letter, it says, Goldstone, this is a quote from inside the letter if you can't read it, Goldstone is Jewish and so are the above mentioned. I guess that's enough said about that. So here's a letter uh, from a company, a New York Pharmaceutical Association, um, and the guy is, uh, he, this is the office in um, San Francisco, and it's from 1922, and this guy's kind of upset, I guess he might have been running for some office in the magic organization there, and uh, just very much belittling anybody Jewish that's in this organization. It's kind of a tragic thing, but we see it everywhere. You see the, um, uh, the seal up on the top, um, the, the um, uh, embossed seal on the top there as well. Now, let's talk about moving into the Holocaust. This guy, Herbert Levin, known as Novelli. Um, so you saw the anti-Semitism from 22, but we know that the Holocaust era is from 1933 to 1945 year Hitler came to power in Germany. And of course, the demise of, uh, of the Nazis and the end of World War II in 1945. So Herbert Levin was a uh, magician and uh, he got caught up in the Holocaust like uh, most Jewish people in Europe of the day. And he survived by doing tricks. He was recognized by SS guards in the, uh, in the concentration camp in Auschwitz. And he actually survived by doing magic. And that's a children's book. I have that both in English and Spanish. Uh, it's, it's all about his, his tale and his life. There's some great stuff, original photos in the back of that book. And then a guy that he met, uh, William Rauscher, wrote this book uh, about death camp magicians and also this pamphlet that we have in our collection. It's pretty hard to find about Novelli and his life and so on. And this is just, I thought you might like to see what it looks like, um, the Spanish version. That, that one's a little tough to locate. And uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, uh, um, Levin Novelli survived the Holocaust, but Louis Lamb, who was a magician, a magic dealer, and an author, he was murdered in the Sobibor concentration camp, the death camp in Poland in 1943. And these are two of the pamphlets that we have originals uh, produced by him, um, you know, obviously before the war started. And um, again, a tragic uh, situation for Jewish magicians uh, caught up and it really didn't matter what you did in those days. Um, if you were Jewish, you were pretty much uh, uh, destined to perish. Alois Kastner, this is one of my favorite parts of my collection. This is an original photo postcard signed by him and dated 1925. And uh, as we'll see about Kastner, during the, uh, he left uh, Germany uh, probably in, around 1940, I suspect, maybe 41. He left and never went back until well after the war. But this is one of the most beautiful pieces of philatelic material I have on our, in our magician collection. Um, this is from before the war. It's mailed in Germany. Uh, it's 1934. Um, so it's a uh, Holocaust era, but before the war started in September of 1939. And this is a printed, um, a printed uh, poster on the back, this is not applied, this is actually printed. And if you can see at the very bottom, it says Adolf Friedlander, Hamburg. And that is a, that's a famous Jewish lithographer that we'll talk about later in our collection from Hamburg, Germany. That's actually printed on the back of this advertising envelope. And uh, Der Zober, is, uh, Zober is, is that's magician in German. And um, so it's a beautiful piece of philatelic material mailed in, mailed in Berlin, advertising a major show that he was about to do. This is a little bit, uh, uh, this is a modern reproduction of a Kastner um, postcard. 
and you see the elephant there, that's his elephant, Toto, and he was famous for making Toto disappear. And unfortunately, Toto disappeared during the war, probably in a bombing raid is what they suspect. There was so much damage uh, all through uh, uh, Germany and throughout Europe at, in, in that time. But that's a famous uh, poster, and you'll see that little spade in the bottom, that logo, that's also an Adolf Friedlander uh, poster. And it's reproduced um, and sent, I, unfortunately the uh, cancel is not clear, but it's a reproduction of a um, 1931 uh, poster mailed in England. This is another uh, uh, card, and this one is uh, from 1939, March. And this is about the time my uh, wife's father was escaping from Poland. Um, he's still operating in, uh, in Europe. And uh, as you can see, this is burned. This is in, this was in. Uh, uh, let me see. This this was actually mailed in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, again, him with the elephant, uh, a, a cachet, a beautiful cachet on the left. It's a uh, uh, airmail uh, uh, envelope. And on the far right is a. Uh, that's just a unusual label. It's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, advertising label of him in the 1920s image of uh, advertising one of his shows. These are some other interesting things. This is uh, 1931 from Prague. Uh, it says Kastner's Indian Collaborator. So Toto was a uh, Indian elephant and that's what's uh, inside this uh, uh, theater program that I have in the collection. And you see uh, uh, Toto holding up uh, Kastner's uh, image there. This is a uh, 1919, um, this letter, which I've not translated, but this is the letter with its uh, uh, appropriate cover from 1919. Uh, it's a beautiful cachet, and that's the magic circle is what that means in German. And the magic circle is a big famous uh, um, magician organization, much like the International Brotherhood of uh, Magicians, IBM, if you will. So that's, uh, this uh, um, program was inside with that letter in that envelope. That was the actual contents. Beautiful piece of uh, 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 magic uh, philatelic material there. Now he also, this is an actual program we have from the Apollo. And uh, you can see they gave out a variety of different tokens um, in different cities. Uh, sometimes they had it by city. Uh, my favorite one, though, is the one on the left where they actually, it's a, you can see it looks, it's, it's a good luck token, uh, and it has Kastner's elephant on the, um, uh, on the reverse side. Now, this is uh, in the 19, this is 1936. These are original photos I purchased from someone in Germany, and these, these came from a, well, we'll talk about where the photos originated. But we know this one is 1936 because that's the Kastner's, that's Toto with an, a cover on him. And that is the 1936 Nazi Berlin, Berlin Olympic bell. And you can see the Olympic symbols off on the bottom there on the uh, cart that it's on. So that's dated 1936 and in a parade where they're advertising the Olympics taking the bell around Germany, uh, there's Kastner uh, performing and you can see the, um, uh, the marquees at a couple of different theaters. So uh, these are some other ones. You see Kastner on the left one, the, um, uh, the uh, elephant with the rider, the trainer. And I wanna make special mention of the uh, yellow arrows there. You see the Kastner hat, but the, I'm really pointing out the individual. That's the same guy on the top and the bottom um, picture. He ended up being part of the Kastner show. It was a German show, German folks. He ended up being a Nazi soldier. And that's whose album all these photographs came from. This guy, and I don't know whether he survived the war or not, but he was Kastner's elephant handler. Now, what's even worse as we get on here, Kastner fled and this guy, Kalanag, He's a Nazi named Helmut Schreiber, a famous German magician also. Huge stage shows, uh, much like what you see with Copperfield today. Uh, Kastner had that kind of show and so did Kalanag. Kalanag, you can see this one particular card here, 
uh, German card mailed after the war, uh, postmarked from Hamburg, Germany. Um, this, this was how they advertised their shows. This is probably from the 1950s. Uh, 53 actually is the Hamburg postmark. Uh, this guy was an actual Nazi. He made these cars disappear after the war. And you can see his wife, Gloria, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, some other postcards. But what was really bad was he stole Kastner's disappearing elephant trick and used the technology to do the disappearing car and other things. And sadly, um, this is a reprint from uh, uh, a magic magazine that's also no longer being produced. But that is him with Hermann Goering, the head of the German Luftwaffe, one of the top Nazis that uh, committed suicide just prior to the uh, Nuremberg trials. And it's really sad. Um, and he tried, this is an actual photograph of him doing uh, magic tricks directly for Adolf Hitler. So it shows you not only did he steal this Jewish guy's magic, but he actually um, was performing for some of the top Nazis. And um, this guy, Rauscher, that wrote the books on Novelli, the, uh, the Jewish, you know, the magician of Auschwitz, uh, he actually wrote this book. If anybody's interested, uh, it's worth reading, The Magician of the Third Reich. And uh, uh, th this is really heartbreaking stuff uh, when you see what happened. This is actually from the September 1964 Genie Magazine on page 29. I'm often asked if I perform for Nazi big shots. This is quote by Kalanag, Helmut Schreiber. Naturally, I did. I performed for Hitler on German Arts Day, and he was impressed with my non-political magic. Once in a while, he would call for me to come in his house in Munich to perform for him. Just like it's perfectly acceptable. And I put a note in there, what would political magic be? I, I have no idea what he meant by that, but um, um, it's really scary stuff when you think about it. Kastner reappeared in Berlin, and I think he did one final show. I think it was in 1956. That may be a card from his final show. It'll, uh, again, uh, an older advertising card reused but he used it to mail just uh, as, as a friendly postcard from his family in March of 1958. Um, really nothing to do with the show. But he kind of never, um, uh, never really did much after the war. And uh, Schreiber uh, tried to perform in America in the 1950s, I believe. I'm not 100% sure if it was 50s or 60s, but once they found out his Nazi background, uh, they made him leave. So he never really performed here in any uh, main, main degree. Another thing I found here, just talking about Kastner, the elephant, Schreiber kind of stealing that show. My cousin, um, when I was talking, um, when I was listening on the, uh, uh, the magic thing over the weekend with Copperfield and so on, um, she talked about these camel cigarette ads, and I thought this was really interesting. I had never heard of this before, and I went and found this. I don't own this. I found it on the web. This is one of a whole series of camel cigarette ads where they were actually telling you how magic was performed, literally giving away how these tricks were done. And I thought it was interesting because here it is, Kastner's trick on, on the uh, disappearing elephant. It turned out that when they were sued, um, they actually won the lawsuit that uh, Camels was not held uh, liable because uh, it, when they do these uh, patents and so on, they actually have to tell how the trick is done if a patent expires, um, that it's already been released, that there is no uh, liability. And I just thought it was interesting because there's some background on the disappearing elephant trick. Eric Jan Hanusen, fascinating as well, a Jewish clairvoyant, and this is a famous book, Hitler's Jewish Clairvoyant, was actually doing things for Adolf Hitler. And uh, when he took over Germany, some of the other uh, uh, Nazis found out that Hitler was really listening to this guy and uh, who knows what he was telling him, but uh, he ended up being murdered and uh, most likely by some of the brown shirts or SS guys. 
And uh, it's fascinating reading. And if you're um, uh, interested in these kinds of things, something about uh, magic and uh, clairvoyance and so on, you might take a look at, um, at this as well. Um, there's also Hitler's Jewish, uh, the Nazi Seance. This is another book uh, by Magida. And uh, again, it's a strange story of a Jewish psycho psychic in Hitler's circle. Fascinating stuff that most people really have no idea took place during that time frame. So I'd like to spend a few minutes on Adolf Friedlander, a Jewish lithographer along with his sons. That's an early picture of him uh, in Hamburg, Germany. And these are some beautiful things from my collection that are showing different circus and uh, um, um, uh, magic type performances that people would use to advertise their uh, um, when, where and when they would be performing. So you can see uh, it's greeting from, uh, Gruss's greeting in German, greeting from the Circus Loeb and uh, different things. But these are all his artwork. And you can see on the bottom one, the AF on the bottom left-hand corner. The other one has the spade. The upper one has the spade on the bottom left, which was his logo. Some beautiful things. Uh, postmark in 1900, uh, 1902, very early uh, 20th century uh, postcards. This one, although it, it was not mailed, this is a, uh, a famous, famous little, uh, little person who was uh, Fraulein Angelica. And this is a very, very rare card of, uh, of what she would look like during her performances, um, uh, stage performances throughout Europe at the time very early 1900s. This is a, a beautiful postcard. This was mailed, um, I'm trying to see the date on this one. I'm not sure if I can get the cancel exactly, maybe 1901, uh, 1910, there it is on the other one. That may be a receiver on the bottom left. Um, it's a beautiful piece of Friedlander uh, artwork uh, for this particular circus, the Bush Circus, very, very famous circus. Gorgeous philatelic uh, uh, material here from the very early 1900s. And this was uh, one that you can see Friedlander's little spade logo on the bottom right of this card. This is a 1920s advertising poster uh, of Kastner's show, uh, Zubermeister, the you know, uh, magician illusion, illusionist, uh, director Kastner. Beautiful, beautiful artwork. And for many of you that know a little bit about magic, devilish kind of things were always very popular in advertising for these kinds of performances. Uh, I thought if you were interested in books and you like to read about these, uh, The Magician of Lublin is a, uh, uh, it's about a Jewish magician in Lublin. It's very, it actually was turned into a movie. And uh, The Magician, a 1973 prize book, uh, on the left-hand side is another one. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an adaption from very early Yiddish, a very early European Jewish language, if you will. And uh, as you can see, Isaac Singer was the winner of a Nobel Prize for Literature with this in 1978. Very, very popular, well-received um, uh, books here. And then for kids, if kids are interested, you have children, grandchildren that you might want. A mitzvah is a good deed in, in, in Yiddish. And the mitzvah magician is uh, just a little something fun uh, for kids to learn about using magic and, and, and learning nice things to do for one another and for other people, doing mitzvahs, doing good deeds for people. Just a fun book. And uh, that really wraps up. Uh, this is a, a fun um, uh, label at the bottom there. Um, if anybody's interested, I'm available after this presentation for a Q&A. But if you have private things, you can reach me at gregphillipson at gmail.com. And uh, we have a host of subjects and uh, on many, many different topics if you're interested. So with all of this, I thank you for your very, very kind attention. I hope everybody had fun. And uh, mostly I hope that some people learned a little bit about something you didn't know about. Thanks a lot and everybody have a great rest of your day.